<laughs> See if I can preach while chomping on some of those hearts right there. You know what we are? We are the church. That's what we are. We're a group of individuals that have a passion and a desire to love God. We're not all the same. We don't all come from the same background. We don't all believe the same. But we all are under the same. All under the love of Christ. We are all goof-ups. Somebody say amen. amen. We've all made mistakes. We're not perfect. But God's love is perfect. And God loved us enough that he died for the church. That's you. The church is not Glenville Baptist Church. The church are the body of believers that have given their life to Jesus Christ. We are part of that church. I found uh, this week on the internet, and I put it into your bulletin. I'd like for you to read it with me, and I thought it was kind of funny, but it explains the dysfunction of church. It says, I think that I shall never see a church that's all it ought to be. A church whose members never stray beyond the straight and narrow way. A church that has no empty pews, whose preacher never gets the blues. A church whose deacons always deke, and none is proud, and all are meek. Where gossipers never peddle lies, or make complaints or criticize. Where all are always sweet and kind, and all to others' faults are blind. Such perfect churches there are, may be but none of them are known to me. But still, we'll work and we'll pray and plan to make our own the best we can. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Aren't we supposed to walk into a church with the desire of that church to be the church that God has in store for us? It's called sometimes I church. We walk into a church and we all have desires. We all have things, our, our needs within our life. With, maybe it's our little kids or, or maybe it's our hurts or our, our pains. And we all walk into a church with desires. And those desires are awesome desires. We have a desire to, to be better. We have a desire to grow. We have a desire to come together and do what God wants us to do. We all have desires when we walk in those doors. If you brought a visitor with you, your desire is that, that, that the preacher preaches a good sermon, that the music is good, that we don't go too long and we don't preach on money. We have desires. What when you come into the church? But here's the problem. When the I becomes important, the desires become expectations. And when the desires become expectation and the church does not live up to your expectation, what happens is the church becomes about you and not about him. I love the church. I have some desires that I want for the church. And I sometimes find myself with expectations and I find out every time that I have an expectation, I get hurt or I hurt others. If I love my church... I have a desire within my soul, a desire within my life to meet their desires. But if every time I meet a desire, they move that desire to a higher level, to an expectation, it seems sometimes all we do is try to please and we cannot serve. And if we have to serve and we 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 never meet that expectation, what happens, it gets very difficult to serve an expectation that is never met. I love my church. I love my church because people are the church. And if we get the mindset that the church is not about pleasing people, it's about honoring God, then I believe we could all say I love the church. But when we walk in the doors and we say, oh, okay, Billy's mad, John's mad, Fred's mad, Bonnie's mad, Tim's mad, Frank's mad, everybody's mad, what it's going to be like, and it's just going to be a blow up. You know what we're saying is, I might as well just stay home. There's no worshiping. There's no honoring God. It is that expectation of what's going to take place. 
And I believe there should be some God-honoring expectations within our soul and within our life. But I believe when we're talking to the body of Christ, we have to have a desire to honor Christ first and foremost, more than me being happy, honoring God is the priority. Let me tell you why I love my church. It's not about us. We place a higher priority on what Jesus wants than what we want. Whenever we take the eye out of the eye church and put the eye into him and never about me, we can please God. I love my church because it's fruitful. New members and new believers. When somebody walks in the door for the very first time or they have been visiting and they come to the church and they meet and they say, we love the church. We, lo we love the music. We love what's going on. They even say this every once in a while, we like your preaching. <laughs> come on, come on. It seems like everybody walks in and loves my preaching. Everybody that walks out, they don't. So I want the new people to come in. <laughs> new members and new believers. It's responsive. I feel supported when programs change and new ministries start and people get excited. I like it that the evolution of ministry cannot have to be the same way every day for the last 30 years. If the evolution of the church has never changed, the next generation has no church. It's responsive. I believe it's also caring, praying for people, requests, visiting people in the hospital, touching people's needs, counseling in their deepest needs. I believe the church is caring. And when the church becomes caring, when the church has empathy for people that are hurting, not judging them from where they've been, not telling them exactly where they need to go, but have empathy where they are. I believe that's when we can love our church because we can come in and we can grab a hold of them and love them and help them. But I believe I love my church because it's diverse. Different countries, different backgrounds, different races. But we're all one. And when we can look at people and not judge them and not have a prejudiced bone in our body, and we all know that we need Jesus and everyone needs Jesus, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're Mexican, whether you're um, Asian, it makes absolutely no difference. We need Jesus. And when we can be colorblind, we can be race blind, but we can only have one focus, and that focus is Jesus Christ. And I believe we are that church. I love our church because of that. We should desire our church in a few areas. Number one, we should desire our church to be a loving church. We should desire our church to be a loving church. What does that mean by a loving church? The opposite of being judgmental. We gotta be loving. You know, some of the sweetest things that I ever get to do is talk to people that are in major chaos. Because <laughs> in the midst of chaos, love can bound. In the midst of chaos, the ointment of a loving church can come up and wrap their arms around people that are desperately in need of somebody that loves them. They may have come out from a church that is legalistic or, or mean-spirited, and because their daughter, or because they got pregnant out of wedlock, they are kicked out of the church. They have a, no idea what church is all about. When somebody does sin, and we all sin, but when somebody does sin, the church shall not kick them out, but they need to embrace them. I love my church because we are a church that are filled full of sinners, but yet we are never satisfied to staying in our sin. What we must do is move forward. A longing for spiritual renewal. A longing for spiritual renewal. A maturity, if you would, that I never want to stay where I am. I want to have God give me insight and give me peace and allow my heart and allow my life to grow to be where I need to be. Not just to sit into a seat, but for the church to grow into a spiritual renewal. And then I believe one of the things that's very important is relationships. I believe the body is the body of Christ. It's referred to in the church as a family. What that means is when somebody is hurting, we hurt. When somebody is in a problem, we come alongside them. At the last sermon of this series, it's talking about sharing our story. What that means is people need you. The church needs you. 
for the church to be a glorification of Jesus Christ, your story that he has changed in you is somebody else's story that needs you. And somebody that needs you, somebody that's desperate, somebody that's hurting, somebody that absolutely has no hope, and you're setting three pews away, and you can say, you know what, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, or last week, I went through that exact same thing, and it hurt. And if I didn't have somebody to come alongside me, I would have never made it. And this guy over here is sitting there just hoping, praying that somebody from the church will walk up beside him and say, hey, how are you doing? They're never going to say a word out in public. They put on their face. They put on their clothes. They're coming to church. But all they're hearing in church is a guy speaking over their head. What they need, they need your story. They need your love. They need your relationships. The church has many facets to make up the church. It does need Bible teaching and preaching. It does need worship. That includes a lot of varieties. It's not just music. Worship through prayer, through reading. And if you're new, what worship is, is worship is getting rid of everything else and focusing on God. Sometimes we can focus on God through song. And whether you raise your hands in prayer and song, that's up to you. Whether you fall on your knees in song and prayer, that's up to you. Really, nobody else matters. Because worship is my heart connecting to God's heart in any way that I can get there. If I'm quiet and know that God is real, if I'm praying or I'm reading the scriptures or I'm singing a song, we desire worship. And then connection to others, becoming a family, <laughs> growing as a Christian, that's discipleship, pointing people to Jesus, that's evangelism or sharing your story, and then serving, that means volunteering. I love our church because we do all those things. I love our church because we have a future. I love our church because God has given to us this group of people, has given to us, our family, individuals that he brought us together for such a place, at such a time, to fulfill your gifts, to bring glory and honor to him. That's what the church is all about. Oh, there's all kinds of different churches. There's all kinds of different doctrines in every other church. But this church, why do I love this church? I pointed down, there's going to be a four-week series, but I brought it down today for the introduction to three points. And I believe these are very important. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, a new commandment I give you. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciple. Here's the big word, if, if you love one another. I believe that one of the biggest things that we need to do in our church is to love one another. Be for and with one another. Has it ever occurred to you that, uh, that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are in one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard in which one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers meeting together, each looking to the same focus, can be in harmony and in tune in worship. When we come together and church and our priority is not my expectation, but what I come to church is my desire to have worship and fellowship and enlightenment to have closeness with God. When we can do that, a new commandment I give you, love one another. Love one another. Not just like your parents loved you, not like what you want to be loved by. He gave us a disclaimer. Love one another as I have loved you. 
as Jesus has loved you. When we can love one another in that mindset, that is unconditional love. Jesus did not meet with the religious leaders. Jesus met with the sinners and the publicans. Jesus was with the people that needed him, not expected him. They desired him. And when Jesus walked into the room, everything stopped. Jesus changed people's lives. He didn't do it with a mean spirit. He did it with mercy and love and grace. A new commandment I give you? Well, the Old Testament's all kinds of love one another's and love this and love that. But the new commandment that Jesus gave to them is love one another as I have loved you. We have an example. We have an example. And the, what would Jesus do? Yeah. In everything of our life. What would Jesus do? How would he handle that? How would he forgive that? Would he forgive that? And the answer is absolutely. He would forgive every issue within our life. In the book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote this. Do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the greatest secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love them. If you ignore someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him even more. If you do good, turn. You will find yourself disliking him less. We need to love one another. As Christ loved us. The church, if somebody comes into the church and they leave, and they have the same taste in their mouth as when they went to the DMV after they left Glenville Church, we have failed. If they come into the church and they say, I, did not receive, I didn't receive anything, I didn't grow, I didn't learn, I didn't accept, I didn't experience the presence of God, we have failed church. When somebody walks in the door and they say, I felt love, I felt the experience. Because if you look at that scripture, that scripture is a beautiful scripture. A new commandment I give to you, the next word is a verb. Love one another. We cannot just say, I love you in church. What we must do is show people I love you in church. Love others as I have loved, acted, loved you so that you must love one another. It's a, it's a commandment. You must love one another. And I love this. By this, all men who are my disciples if you love one another. It's just saying if you don't love one another, others will not know that you're part of the church. The restaurant after you go to church and you go to that restaurant, if you don't love them, you may give them a $20 track that says come to church. You may be mean and you may tell them to take your food back 20 times. You may yell at the restaurant and ask for the manager. You may have your coat and tie on. You may tell them where you go to church, but that's not love. Love is I'm sorry you're having a bad day. God bless you. By the way, I go to church, and if you'd like to come to church, I'd love to have you. We need to think about everything that we do and how we act in every situation. The second thing is we need to encourage one another. Encourage one another. When we encourage one another to love and do good works, true believers will be motivated to persevere in their faith and members who have falsely professed their faith will must be able to stop seeing and doing it wrongly and giving their faith towards God. If we love one another, Jesus commands us, we want to help one another. We want to help one another. We want to have that empathy. See, what, what is encouraging all about? See, in the Bible, when, um, when the new church came together, with all the persecution, with all the hatred, they, it was a battle to go to church. It was a struggle to go to church. What did they do? They learned the word of God and they encouraged. They talked and said, hey, what are you going through? What can I pray with you about? What can I help you in? 
they encouraged one another. And sometimes we come into church and we have all this discouragement. We have all this, what should I do? Our family's a mess. My life is falling apart, but I'm going to put on the facade and I'm going to act like everything's great. I'm going to raise my hands and I'm going to say, Jesus loves me. And I'm going to walk out that door just as discouraged as I was when I walked in the door. What we must do as a church is encourage. A lot of others know that we can help. In Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, for not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Man, it's hard out there. Now, it's not hard out there if we don't proclaim the name of Christ. But if we stand up for Christ, if we stand up for Christ and we share our desires for him, people will hurt the phrase, let us consider, means to actively consider another's trials, temptations, or problems. The word spur is, means to provoke, means to, to help. I want to consider, I, I, I want to know what you're going through. I don't want to belittle you. I don't want to preach to you. I want to encourage you. I want to give you a text in the middle of the fight. I want you to let you know that people are praying for you when we do that. When we do that, they are encouraged. And it starts when you're young. It started with me when I was young. Uh, we used to have a basketball goal right outside of our front door, and my oldest boy loved basketball. And uh, he said, Dad, can we go out and shoot baskets? And you know what that meant? Dad, can we go out and shoot baskets? Dad, can you stand underneath the basketball goal, hand me the ball, and let me shoot it, and tell me how good I am? That's all that meant. So he would shoot, I would go chase the rebound, give it to him, he'd shoot, and he just wanted me to, man, you're doing great, you're doing great, you're doing great. And if the ball went any place, he stayed on the free throw line. My job is to get it. My job was to be the rebounder, but more important than the rebounder is to be the what? Encourager. You're awesome. You can make every basket. Man, I can't wait to see what you're gonna do. That encouragement. Our job sometimes is when in the midst of the problem, it's just encourage, lift up, love people, help them. William Arthur said this, flatter me and I may not believe you. Criticize me and I may not like you. Ignore me and I may not forgive you. Encourage me, I will never forget you. There's two things that you never forget. When somebody encourages you and when somebody helps your children. Whenever somebody helps your child, it's the same as them helping you. When somebody gives your child a compliment, it's the same as you getting a compliment. A smile comes upon mom and dad's face. It's something that's, yeah, yeah they're, 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 they're kind of acting like me. Now you criticize them. Nah, <laughs> ain't my child. My child would never do anything like that. We need to love. We need to encourage. But here we go. The church must forgive one another. Ah, forgiveness. Ephesians chapter four, verse 32. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, in Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. It may not be the battle you're fighting. They may have even brought upon themselves, but nonetheless, they are fighting a battle, and most times, sometimes, they are losing the battle that they are fighting. But they're not quitting. They're not quitting. But here's what happens in the body of Christ. If the body of Christ is not loving, if the body of Christ is not encouraging, and the body of Christ is not forgiving, what happens when somebody goes through their problems, they go away from the church to solve their problems. And the body of Christ has the answer to the problem, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ that can forgive their sins and that can give them hope in the, in the time of their need. But if the church, the body of Christ, looks at them and says, whoa, whoa, whoa. You sit, away, you sit over there with the sinners, right there, that, that row right there. That's where the sinners sit. Yeah, Damon, you need to move over one. That's where the sinners sit. 
All the spiritual ones, I guess, are outside, I guess. All the spiritual ones sit over here. So when you come into church, and guess where the sinners are supposed to sit? Wherever they want. Because we are all sinners saved by grace. And if till we ever remember that we are all sinners, we are all destitute in our sins, and one day I bowed my knees before God and say, I do not deserve this, but thank you. Thank you. And then somebody else walks in those doors, and their sin may be a little different than your sin. Their sin may not need to be as bad as your sin. But guess what they have to do? Forgive me, Lord. Our job is to offer to them the thing that you need, and that's, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Being kind has no boundaries. Being kind is loving and caring. What makes us different from the rest of the sinful world? What makes us different than anybody else that walks in the door? Why would anybody else want the body of Christ to minister to them? In us, we are absolutely nothing. But the only thing that we have that they don't is we have the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and God told us to give our story to others. Tell them what God has done for me. The enlightenment of your forgiveness and the power that God has given to you. The, the stresslessness of your life because what God has done for us, people are dying, they're broken, they're hurting, and all God tells us to do is to go into a world that's struggling, that's broken, that was just like you, and tell them about me. That doesn't sound too hard, does it? Sounds like that's what we should do. If we have family and we have friends and we have people that are hurting, let's just love them. Let's just allow them to know that we are no better than anyone else except we have Jesus. And that same Jesus that we have that has forgiven us wants to do the same thing for them. And all it is is, is what, what's that mean? Acknowledge you have sin. And let's play a game here. Okay, your mom and dads aren't here, so let's acknowledge your game. How many of us have sinned? How many of us needed Jesus to forgive us? How many of us have given our life to Jesus? Accepting my, my fault. I acknowledge I need Jesus. I'm a sinner. Turning from my sin, I want to follow after him. I'm going to leave my sin behind me, and I'm going to move forward through repentance. My confession is Jesus. My gift is eternal life. What God has told us to do, don't make the change by yourself. You know, here's the fun thing. The people that you are in the sin with, they're still in their sin. If you repent and you don't tell them that you're gone, the most important time of a conversion is when somebody has given their life. They have more impact with the world when they are leaving the world than I do from being out of the world. So when somebody says, I'm giving my life to Christ, okay, why don't you talk to those that are in the world with you and tell them, you know what? I know this is hard for you to hear and this is what I'm doing. I got saved last week. I gave my life to Christ last week. I'm not telling you this what you have to do, but I'm telling you what I'm going to do, and I would love to tell you what somebody told me. And when they turn from the world, turn and put their eyes on Christ, they may not follow you to Christ, but they are going to watch you follow Christ. One day, they may say that same thing, it was because of your story. It was because of your forgiveness. It was because of your action. That church that you went to, the story that you told me, I was telling you deep down in my soul, I'm miserable. 
I was struggling. You had enough guts to get up and go. And I was so down in my mire and clay, I didn't have enough guts to get up. I didn't have enough guts to change. But you did. And that story, when you told me what you did, that motivated me. I was scared. I didn't know what to do. But I watched you. And it changed your life. Church, our job is secure. There are so many people that need our story. We can't sit, enjoy, and watch and worship. What we must do is we must love the unlovable. We must encourage the body of Christ to get up and get out and do, and we have to forgive. We have to accept people with forgiveness. Forgetfulness, forget, forgiveness is not forgetfulness it's understanding I am not going to harm you because of what you've done. I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to be holding you accountable in some of your actions. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. In perfect unity. If we are going to be unified into the future, if we love our church, we have to love each other. If we are going to love our church, we have to encourage one another. We're not gonna have the same problems. We are going to have difficulties. We all are gonna have calamities. What we need is encouragement in the midst of the calamity. And when somebody falls, let's be man enough, let's be woman enough, to come alongside them and say, I don't care what other people think. I love you, and I'm going to stand with you because I love you. We need to stand, and that brings unity, and that brings grace. Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm done. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity in the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called by one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, God and the Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There is one thing that the body of Christ has in common. One thing, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And once we have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit of God takes residence in each one of our hearts. That's the body of Christ. If you have never given, to your, li given your life to Jesus, you're not in the body of Christ. You're in Glenville Baptist Church. But once you've given to your life to Christ, you're not in Glenville Baptist Church. You're in the body of Christ. And being in the body of Christ is much better than being in Glenville Baptist Church. I guarantee you that. There's one thing that we have in common, is we have God in our soul. When we sin, that spirit of God is going to break us. It's going to convict us. It's going to challenge us because he loves us. The Holy Spirit that's in your life is in my life. I love my church. I love it for a lot of different reasons. I love being your pastor. I love the people. But what I love more than anything else, I love the challenge. I love the challenge of loving and helping and caring for people that want to have a passion for Jesus. We need to love people. We need to encourage people. We need to not judge people and forgive people and give them the invitation to come to the body of Christ. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we love you. We love your church. You brought into the body whoever you desired. That when they came into the body, the gifts that you have given to them can equip the body to do great things. So, Lord, we ask you to continue to bless this church. We ask you to continue to unite this church that we can love, we can encourage, we can help, we can offer forgiveness 
and we can tell our story to the world. What you did for us changed our lives, and I am not ashamed to tell my story to anyone who has a problem or has an ear. Lord, we love you for that. Protect us in this next few weeks as we talk about our story, your church, your love. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, Pastor Al. Four-week series. I love my church.